يُلِّ الْفَلَاحَ دِيَالَهُ وَأَشْحَدُ أَنْ وَأَشْحَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْحَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فإن أحسن الكلام كلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتفاتها وكل محتفات بدع وكل بدع دلالة وكل دلالة في النار. The talk uh, which I've decided upon over the last ten, ten or so minutes, I've, I've given it a title. Muslim by association and a focus upon women. Muslim by association and a focus with the focus upon women. You see many of the many of the sisters unfortunately and uh, and Allah knows best whether this is something due to their own perversion or whether it is something that they've naturally fallen into as a you know, uh, as, as they've come into Al Islam. And that is that many of the sisters, especially, have become Salafi by association. Not Salafi because they've understood Dawah Salafiyyah or they've understood the principles of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, but rather they are Salafi just by association. My husband's a Salafi, therefore I am Salafi. My brother's a Salafi, therefore I am Salafi. You find this sometimes also in, in, uh, in the brothers also, but a lot of the time this is prevalent amongst the sisters. That they marry a Salafi brother, so I'm Salafi. If I'd married a Tablighi, I'd be Tablighi. If I'd married a Ikhwani, I'd be Ikhwan. If I'd married a young Muslim, I'd be a young Muslim. And this is a disease amongst the sisters and amongst some of the brothers. But mainly amongst the sisters. That they believe that just because they married such and such, that that's why I'm Salafi. And had another man approached me, maybe he was better looking, maybe he could speak a bit better, and he was from Tabligh, I would have become a tab- I'd be a Tablighi today, and Allah knows best. So therefore, this focus that I'm going to give is a focus whereby we have to understand that you cannot be Salafi by association. Just because you are married to a Salafi, just because your father is Salafi, just because your brother is Salafi, that therefore that makes me Salafi. Salafi is an attitude. Salafi is, an, uh, is a way that a person turns his heart towards that which the Sahaba of Allah's Messenger وسلم, were upon. That's what Salafi is. Salafi is not even a level of knowledge that you have to reach a level of knowledge before you are Salafi. Salafi is not that you have to understand every single principle in Dawah Salafiyyah. Dawah Salafiyyah is not that you have to understand the detailed aspects even of Asma wa Sifat or the different rulings upon the Jama'at or the different rulings upon those sects and those, uh, those firqas that have gone astray. It's not necessary that every single Salafi has to know all of this or anyone who claims to be Ahl Sunnah has to know this. Rather, Dawah Salafiyyah is an attitude that a person has. An attitude towards the Haqq an attitude towards that which comes to them, which is the truth. An attitude towards the Sahaba that I'm going to implement every single thing that comes to me from the Sahaba. Therefore, when we say that we are following the way of the Salaf, and the sisters especially, when you say that you are Salafi, you don't say that I am Salafi because my husband is Salafi. You don't say I am Salafi because most of my friends are Salafi. Rather you say, I am Salafi because I have understood what it means to be a Salafi. And what it means to be a Salafi is that first and foremost we understand what the word Salaf itself means. And the word Salaf itself means those who came before you. Literally from the language, this is what it means linguistically. Those who came before you. 
And as Ibn Manzur reports in his Lisan al-Arab, which is one of the most authentic books upon the meanings of the Arabic terminologies, that he says that the word salaf means those who came before you who were righteous. Those who came before you who were righteous. And the most righteous of the people in this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were the Sahaba. In the ummah of Muhammad, the most righteous of the people after the prophets and after the messengers were the Sahaba of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, when we attach ourselves to them, then we say that we have attached ourselves to the best of the Salaf. Or that we have attached ourselves to the righteous Salaf, meaning the Salaf of Salihin. And therefore I am Salafi. As Imam Abu Hanifa, I don't want the sisters especially to pay attention to this. Because we don't want you being Salafi by association. We want you to be Salafi because you understand this Dawah. As Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, in a narration reported by Imam Suyuti in Sawn al He says that Abu Hanifa said that the way that what is sufficient for us or the way that is to be followed is the tariqah of the Salaf. Is the tariqah of the Salaf or the way of the Salaf. Imam al awzai said, who was greater than Abu Hanifa in Hadith, greater than Abu Hanifa in Fiqh, who died in the year 157 Hijrah, he said, that you must stick to the madhab or cling to the path of the Salaf. <laughs> Imam al awdai Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah reports in his Majmu'a al-Fatawa volume 4, page 159. He says that there is no humiliation or there is nothing to be said to the one who attaches himself to the madhab of the Salaf. Rather, it is obligatory to ascribe yourself to the mother of the Salaf, i.e. to call yourself Salafi. It is an obligation. Why? Because that which the mother of the Salaf have gathered together upon, that which the Salaf have gathered together upon is infallible. It's absolutely infallible. It can never err. Because the mother of the Salaf is what? The Quran and the Sunnah and the Ijma of the Sahaba. And this is what we are ordered to cling to. This is what we have been ordered by Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in numerous hadith. And the term Salaf itself, the term Salaf itself appears in an authentic hadith reported by Imam Muslim in his Sahih when he said to Fatima, he said, Fatima, فَنَعْمَ Salaf wa ana laki. O Fatima, I am to you a blessed, I am to you a blessed predecessor. So the word Salaf occurs in this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So anyone who comes to you and says to you that you can't call yourself Salafi because this was invented 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago then our reply to them is no. Rather go to Sahih Muslim. Hadith where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said to Fatima فَنِعْمَ Salaf wa ana laki. That Fatima, I am to you a blessed Salaf, or a righteous Salaf, or a good Salaf. I am to you a good predecessor. And this is why you find the likes of Imam Shafi'i in his Ali Tisam, that he mentions that the person, that, that the people, that no one can interpret an ayah in the Quran, nor any sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, that you cannot make tafsir of it, or make sharh of it, unless, as Imam Shafi'i says, unless you have precedent, from the Salaf al-Saleh. From the Salaf al-Saleh. Imam al-Tirmidhi, likewise, who died in the year 279 Hijrah, likewise, he said that we understand the names and attributes of Asma wa Sifat of Allah as it was understood by the Salaf al-Saleh. So if this term was used in the time of Abu Hanifa, who died in the year 150 Hijrah, in the time of Imam al awzai who died in the year 157 Hijrah, in the time of Imam al-Shatibi, who died in the year 777 Hijrah, and it was used by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah who died in the year 728 Hijrah. So where are you coming to say to us that this term was only used 10 years ago? Or 20 years ago? Or 100 years ago? Rather this term is as old as Islam is itself. Used by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa himself. So when we are claiming to be Muslims, as Allah says in the Quran, 
Allah says, "Huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din al haq liyuthirahu ala din kullihi walau kariyal mushrikun." That Allah says in the Quran. That Allah says in the Quran, "It is he, Allah. It is he, Allah, who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth." So that he can make it so that Allah will establish his religion or this above all other religions even though the mushrikeen may hate it look at this look at this ayah which Allah has sent down the ayah in which he has told us messenger of Allah he has sent him with the message what is the message deen with the message which is huda the guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all other religions whether it be Judaism Christianity whether it be Hinduism or Sikhism whether it be communism or democracy whether it be socialism or anarchy or fascism that Islam will be established over all of these religions because all of them are religions whether they call themselves religion or whether they don't call themselves religion they are still religion and Islam will prevail over all of them no matter how much the disbelievers may hate it Also the same ayah can be understood to mean that it has that Allah has sent his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he has sent him with the huda guidance and the religion of truth to establish it over all other religions meaning anything that opposes Islam so whoever comes with anything that opposes Islam whether it be from within from the munafiqin and the zanadiqa from the munafiqin and the heretics or whether it be from outside of Islam that Allah will allow his sunnah to prevail over all everything and everything that is around it or anything which opposes it so Allah will establish this religion of al-Islam he will establish it and anyone that comes with bidah anyone which comes any person from within the deen of al-Islam who comes to oppose it with their innovation with their false ideas which are alien to al-Islam then Allah will still make it prevail over it over all of the all the schisms within al-Islam with all the other firaq or the or the, or the firqas within al-Islam even though the muqtadi'een may hate it even though the muqtadi'een the innovators may detest it because the sunnah when it meets bidah destroys bidah when the sunnah comes the bidah gets annihilated and that's why imam al-shatibi said the abida is anything which resembles the religion abida is anything which resembles the religion which the people use to come closer to allah but it is not legislated by allah that is an innovation and when as he as he adds in, a, uh, in another saying of his he adds to that that when anyone introduces an innovation into the religion then no by necessity a sunnah is lost and this is also the saying of some of the sahabas also the saying of some of the sahabas that when anyone introduces anything into this religion which is alien to it which is not from the deen of al-islam which is not legislated by allah nor legislated by the sunnah nor legislated by ijma of the sahaba or the consensus of the sahaba then that becomes alien to the religion and anyone who introduces this then know by necessity that they have left a part of the sunnah for example i'll give you a simple example which all of us can understand a person leaves a person innovation to religion the counting of the tasbih upon the beads they have the tasbih beads now they've got clicker counters but they got the tasbih beads and the clicker counters and they count using that so now they've innovated something into the religion the tasbih so much so that if you were to drop it on the floor they'll pick it up and kiss it or they'll put it in a high place in their house or a high place in the masjid and innovation a bidah in the religion by introducing this introducing this bidah into the religion they have lost the sunnah what's the sunnah that they've lost that the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to count after the salah upon his right hand the tasbih 33 times subhanallah 33 times alhamdulillah 33 times allahu akbar and once he used to say the the shahada or, or the extended shahada so the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has gave us the sunnah you try to bring anything which resembles the sunnah or resembles an act of worship 
and then by that you hope to come to close to Allah. But there is no proof from the book and the sunnah, then no, it is an innovation. And the Prophet said that Allah will never forgive an innovator up until he leaves the innovation. The Messenger of Allah said this. In another hadith, the Messenger of Allah said that anyone who innovates or protects an innovator or defends or accommodates an innovator, then the curse of Allah, the curse of the angels and the curse of whole of mankind is upon that individual. So we see here clearly how the sunnah, the sunnah is always destroyed when an innovation is added. And you find a narration from Abdullah ibn Masood, radiallahu anhu, a companion of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He said that as each year goes by, the people introduce new and newer things into the religion up until the whole of the sunnah will eventually become destroyed like it is today almost all of the sunnah is finished except in the hearts of a few people scattered around the earth but generally the whole of the sunnah is gone generally the whole of the sunnah is gone so the sisters especially because it seems that many of the sisters do not place a great focus upon seeking knowledge do not place a great focus upon an attitude towards sticking to the way of the salaf and I want to give you uh, a taste of how it used to be like in the time of pre-Islam. And whether you believe that this is something that you'd like to return to. Because one of the biggest problems that is facing Muslim women today, one of the biggest problems that facing them is peer pressure. The pressure of the society. The Muslim, doesn't, the Muslim sister doesn't want to wear hijab because she's afraid that she might get torn at. Or she's afraid that she might get giggled at or laughed at. So she doesn't want to wear the niqab or she doesn't want to wear the jilbab. Why? Because she fears the laughing and the mocking of the people around her. Peer pressure. Many of the brothers refuse to grow their beard. Why? Because they don't look cool. Because they don't look, you know, smashing in front of the girls. So they want to shave off their beards and look like the girls. Maybe they can mix with them easier then. This is how they have to, this is how this society has fooled us. And I'm not doing this to, to make mockery of those who have, those of you who haven't got beards. But this is just to show how this society has fooled us into thinking and put pressure upon us into believing that by imitating them and falling into what they're into that somehow we are going to come to a status quo or somehow we are going to be allowed to integrate into their society. But know for a sure that Allah says that they will never love you up until you leave your religion and join their religion. They will never love you up until you... So you can shave your beard up. You can put your mini skirt on for the sisters. You can rip up your hijab. You can stop praying. You can stop wearing the kufi and stop wearing the thaw. But as long as you are... As long as you have got a Muslim name. And as long as you affirm Islam to yourself. They will never love you. When you leave your religion. Or you leave major chunks of your religion. Or you show to them no Islam. Then they'll start loving you. Celebrate Christmas with them, they'll say, ah, this is a good Muslim. Why? Because he's decided to integrate into our society. Because he has decided to integrate into our society. And know for the person, for the person who imitates the disbelievers, as Umar radiallahu anhu said, as Umar radiallahu anhu said, that the person who lives in the lands of the disbelievers, and build this house in the lands of the disbelievers and he takes part in the festivities of the disbelievers Allah will raise him on the day of judgment with the disbelievers Allah will raise him on the day of judgment with the disbelievers what are the three signs? number one that we live in the lands of the disbelievers all of us fall into this unless you've got a sincere intention to make hijrah because the Prophet ﷺ said that the Mujahid could die in his own bed. The Mujahid, Fi Sabilillah, who wants to die as a martyr on the battlefield, could die a martyr in his bed due to what is in his heart. Because at the first opportunity that comes to jihad, he will be upon the battlefield fighting Fi Sabilillah. So the one who lives in this country, loving to live in this country, not having a desire to make hijra and go to the lands of the, Mus uh, lands of the Muslims, then he is counting the hadith. But other, on the other hand, the other one who lives in this land and he hates this country and he desires to leave this country and he can't wait to step, land, step his foot and the feet of his children and his wife in the land of the Muslims 
and he's dying and yearning for that, then even if he was to die in this country, Allah will, Allah will raise him as a person who dies in the lands of the Muslims, just like the martyr who dies in his bed. Likewise, the second type of person who builds his house in the lands of the disbelievers, this is the individual who loves to live in the lands of the disbelievers and he establishes himself in the lands of the disbelievers. He has got no intention of leaving this land. So you find him carpeting out his house with the best and most expensive carpet. The one who brings in the leather suites and the satellite TV and he turned his house into a palace because he's got no intention of leaving this country. Nor did he desire to, nor did he seek to, nor did he take steps to. That money which he's spending, the thousands of pounds which he's spending upon the leather suite and the carpet and the thick rugs and the night camp stereo TVs, if he was to save that money and gather it together with the intention of making hijrah, then maybe Allah's reward be upon him. But no, he builds his house in the lands of the disbelievers. And the third and the most destructive of all of these three, that he takes part in the festivities of the disbelievers. They celebrate birthdays, we celebrate birthdays. They have an wedding anniversaries, we have wedding anniversaries. They have Christmas for the birth, they claim the birth of Isa. So we have to have a Christmas for, or, or, or uh, Eid Milad and Nabi for the birth of Rasulullah. Either we take part in their festivities or we imitate their festivities. How will he be raised? On Yawmul Qiyamah he will be raised with the disbelievers. On Yawmul Qiyamah he will be raised with the disbelievers. All because of what? Living in this country we have to save our skins. We have to save our skins. We have to save ourselves and save our families from the fire. And the way that you're not going to save them is by giving him to the pressure of this society. Let me bring you one example. From the time pre-Islam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, pre-Islam, that in the books of Tariq, or in the books of history and the books of Zira, there is a narration reported by one of the people who described what took place to in, in, in his lifetime before the advent of Al-Islam. But before I do that, let me quote you two ayat from the Quran. The first ayat, Surah Nahl, 58 and 59. These two ayat. Allah says here, the translation of which is, and when the news of a birth of a female child is brought to any of them, when the news of the birth of a female child is brought to any of them, his face becomes dark and he is filled with inward grief. What is Allah talking about here? Allah is talking about the practice of burying the firstborn female child alive. Offer if you have five female children in a row, in the time of pre-Islam, if you had five female children, firstborns, then you would have to bury one after the other, after the other, after the other, up until you got a male child. After you had the male child, then it would be okay for you to have female children. But if you had a female child, you had to bury her alive. So Allah is talking about an event that used to occur to them. What was it? And when they found out that their wives had females, she had given birth to a baby girl. When this news was brought to the father, his face would become dark with grief. And, it, and inside you would feel a turmoil and a grieving. How come I've had a female child? How come Allah has given me a baby girl? Allah says in the second ayah, and thereafter he hides himself from the people. When he has realized that, he's given, that his wife has given birth to a girl, he hides himself from the people because of the evil of that whereof he has been informed. Because the people tell him that this is evil that has happened to you. So what does he do? He hides himself from the people. Then he says, Shall he keep her with dishonor or bury her in the earth? Certainly evil is their decision. So now he has a choice of doing one of two things. Either he can keep the girl, whereby everyone, everyone leaves him. He has dishonor. Everyone mocks him. He is not invited to any of the weddings. He is boycotted from the whole of society. And the whole of society looks down upon him as if he was a person with no honor and no respect. Or does he bury her? And by burying her alive, 
Allah gives him authority. When he buries her alive, the society gives him honor and gives him respect. And says, MashaAllah, you have buried your daughter, aren't you an honorable person? This is what used to occur in that society. So look at the society, how the society used to impress upon the people the pressure. Now let me go back to the story. Let me go back to the story, which is a true story which occurred pre-Islam. There was a man, later on from what we understand, he became a Sahaba, he embraced Islam. But before Islam, he had a first daughter. When his first daughter was born, he knew that he couldn't keep her. He knew that he couldn't keep her. The society would never allow this to happen. So what does he do? He has to go out. So he takes the daughter out, the young girl, she's about a week old, two weeks old, he takes her out. Digs a hole for the baby girl, places her in the hole and buries her alive. Pours the sand into her mouth up until she suffocates and dies. First child. One or two years later, he has a second child. Again it's a girl. Again it's a girl. And when he was burying the first daughter, he felt grief and sorrow in his heart. Why? Because the heart becomes attached. After all, it's his own flesh and blood. When the second girl was born, he couldn't do it. He decided that he wasn't going to do it immediately. He's not going to do it. He wants to leave it off. So he tells the people around him that, yes, I've had a baby girl. You all know I've had a baby girl. But I'm going to bury her soon. So a week goes by, he doesn't bury the girl. Two weeks go by, he doesn't bury the girl. A month, two months go by, he doesn't bury the girl. The baby girl now starts to grow. The baby girl now starts to grow. The baby girl now starts to make sounds from her mouth. His heart becomes attached to the baby girl. The society around him, the mushrikeen, the disbelievers, his neighbors, his so-called friends, his so-called family, his uncles, his brethren, his own brothers and his own sisters are looking down upon him. He's got a two-month-year-old girl and she's the firstborn. And he's not burying her and he's two months gone. The father's heart becomes attached to the girl even more. Three months go by, four months go by. Now the baby, he sees the baby and the baby smiles at him. Now the baby's showing some expressions on her face. And his heart becomes very attached to the child. He sees that his wife is becoming attached to the child. She's breastfeeding the child. Then nine months go by, a year goes by. Now the child is running around in the house. When the, when the people around him, his neighbors and his friends and the society around him tells him, what are you doing? Do you have no honor? You've got this despicable girl in your family. You are dishonoring the people of Quraysh. You are dishonoring the disbelief. You are dishonoring us. When are you? He says, I'm going to bury her. By Allah, I'm going to bury her. It's just a matter of time. A whole year goes by, he doesn't bury her. Now the child is running around the house. And he becomes very attached. He doesn't want to bury her. He doesn't want to kill the child. So then two years go by. Eventually two years go by. He tells the people around him, I'm going to bury her. I'm going to bury her. Then the day comes. Around about two years later, the day comes. Now the child is two years old, running around. Now the children here are running around. So then he decides, today I'm going to have to do it. Because I have no honor, I have no face in front of society. They're mocking me, they're laughing at me. I have no honor. And they're all cursing me. My family's not talking to me. So he takes the little girl. And he says, today we're going, he says to his little girl, today, my daughter, we're going out to play. So he takes his little girl and takes her out into the desert. He takes her out through the streets of Mecca and takes her to the outskirts of Mecca. And the little girl, as he's walking with her, starts running around him. The little girl starts running around him playing. She says, Abby, where are we going? He says to her, we are going to go and play. We're going to play out by, by the outskirts, we're going to play with the trees and whatever. And as he's telling her this, he knows in his heart that he's going to bury her. This little girl, who has put all of her trust in her father and in her mother, as the children do at that age. They have no tawakkul, they don't know anyone except their fitra, and their fitra inclines them towards Allah. And their fitra inclines them towards their parents, the mother and the father. And she puts the whole trust in the hands of her father. 
So now as the father's walking, tears are streaming from his eyes. Because he has so much attachment in his heart to his child. Tears are coming from his eyes. Because he knows where he's taking the daughter. Then the little girl says, Father, why are you crying? Why are the tears coming from your eyes? He says, these aren't tears, just water or whatever. It makes an, ex- it makes an excuse. As he walks through the, uh, towards the outskirts of Mecca, then he comes to the place and he decides this is where he's, where he's going to do it. So the daughter, his little daughter, she's running around plucking at the flowers. You know, picking up flowers and messing about like this. So then, when she's plucking the flowers and playing around, he starts digging the hole for his daughter to bury her. As he's digging the hole, the little daughter, his little daughter sees what he's doing. So she says, Abby, shall I help you? So he says, yes, come and help me. So she starts digging the hole. Why? Because all of her trust and reliance is in her father. She thinks father's playing a game with her. So are we playing a digging game, digging game, Abby? Yes, we're playing a game. So she helps him dig the hole. And she's digging the hole with him. And they're both digging the hole in the ground. Up until the hole is dug, all the way through, tears are streaming from the eyes of the father. And the only reason he's doing it because of the pressure of society. Because of the pressure of society. Up until the hole is dug. And when the daughter stands in the hole, the hole just about covers her. She's standing in the hole. She's standing up upright. And the hole is right up to her head. It's that deep. So then he starts, he says to her, he tells her stand in the hole. So she stands in the hole. Then he starts throwing sand into the hole. Up until it covers her ankle. And then she starts helping him because she thinks that Abby's playing a game with her. And sorrow is overtaking the father. He can't control his tears. So the sand is coming in. She's helping him. And she's laughing at him. And she's saying, Abby, we're playing a game. Up until he reaches her knees. Then up to her waist. Then eventually reaches her chest. And then she finds breathing difficult. Because the sand is constricting her chest. And she says, Abby, my chest is hurting. Abby, my chest is hurting. So then she sticks out her hand out of the sand and she puts her hand up. And the father's crying all the way through. The tears are streaming from his eyes because he hates to do this. She puts her hand, uh, she puts her hand through the sand into the air. She says, Abby, give me your finger. So he puts his finger into her hand. Then with the other hand he starts, he still puts the sand into the hole carries on putting the sand into the hole up until he reaches her nose and mouth and she begins to suffocate and as she suffocates she starts spitting because she's trying to spit the sand out of her mouth up until it reaches her head and the whole of the body is covered and the narration finishes by saying that her, the, she kept the grip upon the finger of her father for a few minutes up until death overtook her two years old she was why did he do this? Because of the pressure of society around him. Because of that which society tells us to do over and above that which Allah has created us for. So imagine that this is what this society that we are living in today, this is what they want us to do. They want us to leave the worship of Allah. They want us to leave that which Allah has created us for. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ and I have not created you. I have not created the jinn, nor the mankind, except that they should worship me alone. Except that they should worship me alone. So what does this society do to you? Everything in this society that you are living in today, especially the sisters, everything in this society that you are living in today is designed to take you away from the worship of Allah. Everything, whether it be the TV, or the football, or the clothes, or the leather suites, or the TV, or the radio, or the music. Everything that this Kafir society has set up for you is designed to take you away from the worship of Allah. So up until you leave your religion and you are upon what they're upon, they will never be satisfied. Because honor to them, honor to them with regard to the women is a woman who walks around naked in the street. She's dressed but she's naked. She's either got skin tight clothes on so you can see the form of her body. Or she's got hardly anything on at all. Hardly anything on at all. And that is honor to them. To them this is liberation. To them this is liberation. Where in fact this is in fact enslavement to the society. 
And this is why you find that they talk about the Holocaust in the Holocaust in Germany. They say, look how many Jews Hitler killed. They say he killed six million Jews from 1939 through to 1945. Over a six year period they say that Hitler exterminated six million Jews. Do you know how many abortions take place in America every year? One year. Three million abortions every year in America alone. In the USA alone. So over a six year period, that's 18 million children that are murdered. Due to what? Due to what they call choice. My stomach or my fetus, my embryo, I got pregnant, it's up to me. 18 million abortions every six years in America alone. How is that different to what they did amongst the Quraysh, the disbelieving Quraysh? How is that different? And that's just in America. What about in India? Because they can't afford abortions, they pull out the fetus through a natural birth and then they throw it into ice cold water up until it's died. Because the ice cold water will kill it by shock immediately. Because they can't afford abortions. Or, as some of them used to do in some of the hospitals in India, throw it into liquid nitrogen or something like this up until the child is just killed. Because they can't afford abortions are too expensive. And then they're going to turn around and tell us that this is honor, this is choice. What kind of choice are they giving you? That child that is inside your belly, that child that is inside your uterus, is a child which Allah has created. And you're going to turn around and claim that Hitler killed six million Jews over a six year period, and you're killing three million babies every year in America alone, through to what they call freedom of choice. So the women especially must start opening their eyes. Do you not see that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that the first fitna, the first fitna to, to, to strike the children of Israel was the fitna of the woman. The first fitna or the first calamity to hit or to strike the Bani Israel or the children of Israel was the fitna of the woman. In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, the greatest fitna I fear for my ummah is, that of, is the fitna of the woman. The greatest calamity I fear upon my ummah is the calamity of the women. Now this calamity is to be taken in two regards, or there's two aspects to this. The first aspect to it is, the first aspect to it is that the woman herself is to blame. Because she herself allows herself to be exploited and she oppresses others through her own exploitation. So the first blame is firmly in the hands of the woman. The second blame is in the hands of the man who exploits women. The second blame is in the hands of the man who, allow, who, who exploits women. So you see them today. What do you see them doing? When they want to sell you a car. When they want to sell you a car. What do they, what do they put on the bonnet of a car? A woman in a bikini. You want to buy a car to take you from your house to work every morning. But before they can, before you are tempted to buy the car, you won't buy the car up until there is a naked woman upon the bonnet. When they have the car shows at the NEC and all these other places around the country, every time they want to advertise a car, a Ford, a BMW, a Mercedes or any other car, what do you see them doing? Next to the car will be a blonde, six foot high, half naked. Or in fact, sometimes to totally naked, as in some of them do. Some of them even, they will put naked women there. Naked women, just topless. And, say, and they won't be able to sell their cars up until they do this. And this is liberation, and this is honor. I was reading an article the other day, an internet, uh, an article from a, from a webpage magazine that's published every month. It said that the psychologists say, that, that man thinks about sex every six seconds. That's what they said in this article. Then they said, now we will quote you a fact. That was a psych you know, what the sociologists and the psychologists say. 
Now they said we're going to quote you a fact. That every two seconds on the internet, someone accesses the pornographic homepages. Every two seconds. And what do you find on those homepages except naked women? And they call this liberation. So don't be surprised when they frown upon you for wearing a niqab or when they frown upon you for wearing a hijab because what they want to see you doing is lying upon those home pages what they want you to be is like those women who lie upon the bunnies of cars or sell chocolate and ice cream they want to sell you a chocolate they, they put a naked woman in front of you and they say that this is honor and then some of the sisters have the audacity and the gall to say we are living in this society I remember last year or the beginning of this year that some of the, some of the sisters are organizing trips to Alton Towers and all this kind of stuff in hijab going around the right <coughs> in hijab going around the right and what was their argument well we need to have fun don't we this is fun man tashabba bi qawmin fa huwa minhum Whoever resembles the people is from them. You love what they're upon, you like what they're doing, then you'll be like them. You love those people, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you'll be with those whom you love. You love the disbelievers, you'll be with them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You love the people of Bidah, you'll be with them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You love the people of Sunnah, you'll be raised with the likes of Umar. coming from the side of the men who are exploiting the women whether it's coming from the side of the women who are using their bodies as a tool to dupe the men to dupe the men then both of them are shayateen those women who think that they can dupe us <coughs> then they are shayateen and those men who believe that they can exploit women and they're not going to have to face Allah and Yawm Al-Qiyamah then they are shayateen also they are shayateen, they are devils also. Men and women with the hearts of devils. But rather, the true believer, the true mu'min, and the true mu'mina are those who make their worship purely for the sake of Allah. You don't care what society around you has to say. All you're concerned about is, am I pleasing Allah? Am I pleasing the messenger? Because one day, one day you may be in the same position as that man who had to bury his daughter. One day you may be in that position. And then you'll be asking yourself, how did I get here? And how many of the brothers and sisters have left this dawah due to the weaknesses that they have? They see the glitter and the decoration of the society around them. They see how nice it is. Or they believe they, they think how nice it is. So they run towards the decorations of the dunya. They find things that are easy to do. Committing zina is easy. Drinking alcohol is easy. Going to the nightclubs is easy. Listening to music is easy. So they find it easy to go in there. Why? Because their hearts weren't firm upon the love of Allah. They never made themselves close to Allah at any stage. At any stage. They never made their religion upon the firm foundation. This is why you find. This is why you find. And I know a story which occurred several years ago. A brother and a sister were married. Eventually, to whatever problems they had in the marriage, they both got divorced. They both got divorced. The brother himself remained Salafi. And this is what I mean by Salafi by association. The brother himself remained Salafi. Why? Because he was Salafi, he married her, she became Salafi. And he used to take her to circles, but she wasn't, her heart wasn't in it. Because she didn't give her heart to Allah and His Messenger وسلم, or to the obedience of Allah and His Messenger So what happened? They got divorced, they got separated First thing that happened was she continued wearing the jilbab for a few months Then eventually the, the, the khimar or the headscarf remained the jilbab came up a loose skirt and a baggy shirt Then several months later the, the khimar came up and a hat came on. But I'm still covering my head. She put her hair in front and she put it as a, you know, like a, a knot in the top. And she put her one of them trendy hats on. 
you know, one of them cowboy hats or something like that. Several months went by, the hat came up, the hair came down. I'm still a Muslim. One of the sisters met her, she said, I'm still a Muslim. No hijab, no khimar. One by one, one by one you find them. The veil is lifted, one by one. Now, Allah knows best one. Someone came to me recently, because we're still concerned about this, they said she become murtad. Left the fold of Islam altogether. Look where she began. She began as a Muslim who married a Salafi brother, but she married him Salafi by association. And now she's a murtad heading for the hellfire. And this is what is meant by Allah, by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what is meant when he said that a person may do the deeds of the people of paradise so much so that he's only a cubit length away or a hand span away from the, from the paradise. He does so many or she does so many good deeds that you're only a hand span away. You can even smell it or taste paradise. And then what is written for them overtakes them and they do the deeds of the people of hellfire so much so that they are thrown into the hellfire. And then a person may do the deeds of the people of the hellfire. So much so that you may be only a hand span away from the hellfire. And then what is written for you overtakes you. And then you start doing the deeds of the people of paradise up until you enter into paradise. So look at the example of this sister. She married the brother and it seemed as though, because she was a Kafir to begin with, she became a Muslim. She did so many good deeds. But it was by association. Good deeds by my husband doing them, I'll pray behind him. He fasted the month of Ramadan, I'll, I'll fast the month of Ramadan. So they started doing the deeds of the people. So she starts doing the deeds of the people of paradise. Prays five times a day. Goes to the Musalla on Eid, on Yom al Eid, on both Eid. She fasts in the month of Ramadan. She gives the zakat. She covers herself. Maybe she'll even come to a few circles. She does the deeds of the people of paradise. But first, before she became a Muslim, she was doing the deeds of the people of hellfire. And she was a hand span away from hellfire. Allah allowed her to become a Muslim. She became, by doing good deeds, she, maybe she became from the paradise a hand span. Then she reverted back to doing the deeds of the people of hellfire. And she's upon that now. How dangerous it is. And this is why the Prophet Sil Aisha radiallahu anha used to say that the Messenger of Allah used to make, make one particular dua very very often. Ya muqallab al qalub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh, oh, oh the one who, who, who oh, turner of the heart, the one who turns the heart. Keep my heart thabbit firm upon this religion. Oh turner of the heart, keep my heart firm upon your religion. So we know that the heart is something which is weak. The heart is something which is prone to desires. So many of you are holding on to the religion by the skin of your teeth. Just holding on to Islam, never mind Dawa Salafiya. Many of us are holding on to, the, to, to Islam by the skin of our teeth. What about Dawa Salafiya? And by Allah, I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles in this time as they occurred in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As they occurred in the time of the Messenger. When? In the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he split the moon into two by the power of Allah. Split the moon into two. The mushrikeen came to him, you the Messenger of Allah? He said, yes. Where's your miracle? He said, all right, meet me after Asr. So they met him after Asr in Mecca. Three or four years before the Hijrah. Or three years before the Hijrah. He said, now watch this. He pointed towards the moon and the moon split into two as Ibn Abbas said. Split into two so much so that one half of the moon fell behind the, fell behind the mountains of Mecca. One half of the moon fell behind the mountains of Mecca. So those modernists who claim to know science and they call it an astronomical or a meteor, uh, like, like, like a meteor blast or something that occurred, throw, pick that up and throw it out the window. Just like the ones who believe that the jar is a TV in the corner of your room. Throw this rubbish away. The splitting of the moon is real. The Dajjal is a human being who is real. Juj wa Majuj are not the United Nations. Juj wa Majuj are not a Scottish tribe who live in Dundee. 
Jude wa majud are two tribes of human beings who are stuck in a mountain in, uh, by, by the foothills of southern Russia. Put behind the mountain by Dhul Qurnayn. So likewise the moon was split into two. I believe in a miracle that occurred today. A miracle that is occurring today. What is that miracle? That miracle is that we are living in a land of 60 million kuffar. 60 million disbelievers. And in this land of 60 million disbelievers, <coughs> where everything from the parliament to your schooling from nursery through to junior school, through to secondary school, through to college, through to university, is all trying to prove to you that there's no God, a godless society. In this land, when you go to work, whether you work in British Rover or whether you work in the bakery across the road, all of it is designed, is designed so that your whole day is spent forgetting Allah. That your whole day is designed so that you would forget Allah. They start the work early in the morning at 9 o'clock or even earlier than that so that you have no time to pray Fajr. Whole of society set up like this. In this land of 60 million kuffar, Allah guided, look how many non-Muslims there are or how many ex-non-Muslims there are who have been guided to Al-Islam. In this land, where for 1400 years there has been no Salafis established in this land. Do you realize this is the first generation? This generation that we're living in now is the first generation of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in the lands of the disbelievers of England. This is historical and a landmark in history. So when the books of Tariq are written four or five hundred years from now and Britain becomes Darul Islam, inshaAllah, due to the da'wah that we make, then they'll say that the first Muslims to spread da'wah Salafiya were in the 1980s and the 1990s Christian era. Or in the years by the end of the 14th century and the beginning of the 15th century Hijra. In the books of Tariq. It's a miracle that Allah has allowed Islam and Dawah Salafiyah to come into the land of the Kuffar. And you were, de- you were in the depths of Kuffar and disbelief. And Allah guided you to Al-Islam and allowed you to become a person at least with a chance of entering into Jannah. Not only did Allah do that, but when you came into Al-Islam, look how many groups and parties that you saw. Jumaat al-Tabliq, Jumaat al-Ikhwan, Jumaat al-Dis, Jumaat al Dat, the Ashkari, the Jahmi, the Hizbut Tahrir, every group that you can think of. And you came into al Islam and you had to take a step back and take a deep breath. What have I come into? I thought Islam was one and Islam was pure. And you thought to yourself, what have I let myself into? Those of you who are non-Muslims and you came into Islam. Or those of you who were born into Muslim families but rediscovered Islam. And you thought to yourself, what have I done? What have I entered into? And you became despairing. Then Allah guided you to the same sex Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah or the same sex as Dawah Salafiyah or the same sex as Habul Hadith, Firqatul Nadiya, Taifatul Mansura, whatever title you want to give it. Allah guided you to become a Salafi. That's what Allah did for you. Not only that, but then Allah guided you to a man, to a man who lived 4,000 miles away from here and is the greatest muhaddith of this ummah, of this generation. Look, 60 million kuffar, 2 billion disbelievers in the West. 2 billion kuffar in the West. And Allah guides you not only to Al-Islam, not only to the same sex, but you open up a magazine and it says Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Qayyim, and Imam al-Bukhari, and Imam Ahmad, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Imam al awzai In the lands of the disbelievers, Allah guides you to this and you don't believe in miracles? On top of this, Allah guides you to a man 4,000 miles away, the muhaddith of this ummah of this time, Sheikh Abu Abdul Rahman, Muhammad Nasiruddin al Albani, Habibullah. Allah guides you to him and guides you to his books and to his work. And he, in turn, guides you to the path of the Salaf, the path of the Sahaba. Miracle after miracle after miracle. So how can a Muslim be despaired? 
How can a Muslim despair? And I'm going to finish with this final ayah. I'm going to finish with this ayah, inshallah. Just to let the sisters know that, the, that your path to Jannah is as easy as the path to Jannah for the men. Allah says in the Quran, Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimat, wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minat, wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitat, wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqat, wal-Sabirina wal-Sabirat, wal-Khashi'ina wal-Khashi'at, wal-Muttasaddiqina wal-Muttasaddiqat, wal-Sa'imina wal-Sa'imat, wal-Khafidina farujahum wal-Khafidat, wal-Wazakirina Allaha kathiran wazakirat. Now Allah says in this ayah, as as a nasiha and as a reality that, is, that, that should be implanted, implanted in our heart that Allah says verily the Muslims men and women the believers men and women the men and women who are obedient the men and women who are truthful the men and women who are patient the men and women who are humble the men and women who give charity the men and women who observe fasting the men and women who guard their chastity the, and men and women who remember Allah much with their hearts and with their tongues Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward meaning paradise so the point here is that Allah will reward you for your worship men and women are not equal we all, as Muslims we all know that just by looking at the body of the woman and looking at the body of the man you see that they are different they're different and Allah has created you different Allah has put a different type of heart in the man and a different type of heart in the woman Allah has put a different type of thinking in a man and a different type of thinking in a woman therefore Allah has given a man his role and a woman his role and we'll discuss this inshallah tomorrow Wallahu alam wa billahi tawfiq and I'll finish there inshallah and maybe give the second part of this tomorrow at, at some stage inshallah is there any questions? Yeah. What reply do we give to Muslims who say that we are Wahhabis? What is Wahhabism? I ask you to save this question for this evening, inshallah. But there's no such thing as Wahhabis anyway. That's the simple answer. No such thing. When the Prophet was called Majnoon and crazy and mad that because they want to attack the people of Ahl Sunnah they will call you Wahhabi. In simple that's the answer. But if we save this till the evening I prefer to cover the topic that we talked about first and maybe uh, aim it towards the sisters first and foremost. And put the other questions about Wahhabism and whatever, whatever these slander that they make against the Salafis we'll put them uh, later. <laughs> what sexually related things are not allowed? In brief, in brief, that a man is allowed to allowed to cohabit with his wife in any manner that he chooses, except that he is not allowed to enter uh, the anus. Anything else? That anything, everything is permitted. That a man may cohabit with his wife in any way which he chooses with his wife or his slave women, but. There's not none of that going on these days. But with his wife, he may cohabit with her in any way that he chooses, except that he is not allowed to enter the anus. Everything else is permitted. Everything else is permitted. So that's the simple rule. And you find it in the Quran where Allah says, and enter your till in any way which in any way that you please. It says here, dear brother, Islam is all about leaving all the good things. I having a good time, you know, having fun with women and women having fun with men, parties, drugs. Why are, why are all the things I enjoy, why should I leave them for a drab life of a long beard and short trousers? It is very unconvincing. Allah <laughs> wa I'll quote you one hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, sent and I think the brother quoted it in the last talk that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, uh, created the hellfire and created the paradise and he sent Jibreel to look at the hellfire 
And when he saw the hellfire, Jibreel came back and he said to Allah, Ya Allah, I fear that anyone who hears about the hellfire will never enter into it. Then Allah sent him to paradise. And when he saw the gardens of paradise, Jibreel came back to Allah and he said to Allah, O oh Allah, I fear that anyone who, who hears about paradise, uh, he will not accept or enter it. That he will enter it if he hears about paradise. He will not hear about it, except that he will enter into it. Then Allah put all beautification around the hellfire. And Allah put all hardships around paradise. And the beautifications of the hellfire are like, for example, zina, drinking, gambling, not worshipping Allah, not having any reliance upon Allah, forgetting about Allah, all these matters. Allah put all those easy things around the hellfire. And Allah put some of the hardships around paradise, such as praying your five daily prayers, such as fasting in the month of Ramadan, which is a hardship, such as making Hajj, which, is, which has its difficulties, such as making Jihad fi Allah upon the battlefield, which does have its difficult, which is difficult. So Allah put all of these things around paradise, and then He sent Jibreel again. And then after seeing the hellfire, the Jibreel alayhi salam said that I fear that, that everyone who hears the, who, who, who sees these decorations around the hellfire will have no will, will have no choice or will have no way but to enter into it. That you will enter into it because of the beautifications of the hellfire. And the, because of the difficulties around paradise, then anyone who, who sees those difficulties may not even enter into paradise due to the difficulties. And then Allah and, and the meaning of the and I've only quoted the meaning of the hadith and then the, at the end Allah, Allah makes a statement to the effect that my believing servants will enter into paradise for those who believe in me and, and follow me and such and such that they will enter into paradise showing that Allah has created life and Allah has created death to see which of us are best in deeds Allah has created life and Allah has created death as Allah says in the Quran to see which of us are best in deeds and in another ayah in the Quran Allah tells us that did you think that you were going to be given Iman and then be left without being tested so this is a test for us this is a test for us to see which one of us that when you are given the choice between loving Allah and being subservient to Allah or loving the dunya and being subservient to the dunya and you start worshipping naked women and naked men and, and worshipping the music and all this other type of rubbish that which of you has Allah in high regard and which of you have the dunya in high regard? It's a test. So those of you who find the deen of Al-Islam unconvincing, then you are kuffar and you are fallen outside the religion of Al-Islam if you find Islam unconvincing. Because Islam, we all have weaknesses. No doubt, as Allah says, or as the Messenger of Allah said, that the, the son of Adam, he erred. All, every one of the son of Adam erred. The best of those who err are the ones who turn to Allah in repentance. The best of those who err are those who turn to Allah seeking His forgiveness. So we all err. Some of the companions, a female companion, a female companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, committed adultery. Adultery she committed. She came to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, I committed adultery. The Prophet sallallahu turned his face away from her. Then she went to him again and she said, I committed adultery. Then he turned his face from her again. Then he went to her, she went to him a third time. He said, oh messenger of Allah, I committed adultery. He said, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? She said, I want repentance. He said to her, are you pregnant? She said, yes. He said, let the, he said, let the child be born. Then come to me after that. After the child was born, she came back. He said, repentance is that you are stoned to death. And she was stoned to death and some of the companions were cursing her. Oh, she was a zaniya, she was an adulteress and blah, 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 this. So the Prophet ﷺ said that if, that if you were to gather the repentance, or well, well, gather repentance, is gather repentance of the people of Medina, together it would not equal the repentance that this woman have, has gained. I.e. that because of her being stoned, her sin of adultery has been forgiven, wiped out. And what about the companion? What about the companion? who drank alcohol not once, not twice, three times continually and the Messenger of Allah lashed him and lashed him again and then he said why do you do this? is it because you oppose what I've told you? he said no, I love Allah and I love his Messenger but I have this weakness so we all are weak as long as we don't make those things halal for ourselves 
as long as you don't say, I don't want to grow a beard because it's not from the Sunnah. That's haram. Now you are you are you are committed kufr. Now you have committed kufr. I'm not going to wear hijab because hijab is not from the Sunnah. Now you have committed kufr. I'm going to drink alcohol because I don't care what Allah says. Now you're a kafir. But if you drink and you do all these matters out of a weakness because you are sinful, then we are all sinful. But you have to turn to Allah and seek His repentance. Seek His repentance. And verily, Allah is Al-Ghafoor Al-Rahim. Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. 